Good evening and welcome to Temple Heights Baptist Church on our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, bienvenido a nuestro servicio de los miércoles en la Iglesia Bautista de Temple Heights. We are going to begin with A Mighty Fortress is Our God. song because whenever I sing this song, I think of William. <laughs> yes. Yes, and William is going back to Liberty on Saturday, so he's going to make the 12-hour so drive on Saturday morning, so 
Uh, when you when we do meet and greet, give him a big hug and say goodbye till we see him again. So pray for him as a college, all our college students as we get back to college. And welcome back for those who uh, we haven't seen in, uh, over Christmas period. And hopefully you had a wonderful time on vacations and family. And so welcome back um, to, to our services. We have missed you all. Let's open in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we just praise you for today. We praise you for this opportunity in the middle of the week to gather together, Lord, and uh, Lord, be with our church family and uh, encourage each other, see how the week so far has been going, Lord, and Lord, be able to, to dive into your word together and sing praises together, Lord. We, uh, we just love this time. Lord, be with us as the kids go to Awana and learn um, Bible verses. Uh, and Lord, be with Brother Stephen. Lord, fill him with the Holy Spirit, Lord, as he leads the Bible study for the Spanish. And fill me with the Holy Spirit as well, Lord, for the English. Lord, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, and our next song is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <laughs>
last song of the day. is Rock of Ages. because I was still stuck on the Sunday service because we like to rock. Okay, <laughs> that was all. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I like it when people are listening to the services. <laughs> all right, we got moving into January. This weekend is pretty busy for, uh, for us. Uh, on Friday night, outreach is starting up again, so at 7 o'clock. Uh, come and hear Patriots and uh, pizza and uh, for the youth or the old, whatever the case may be, come on out. Uh, we want to grow this ministry. Um, and so be with Patriots, hear them do Philippines. And then Saturday morning, bright and early, 8 o'clock, we have the men's ministry. So men, come on out for, uh, for that, uh, breakfast in the morning. And then that evening, Jackie White is restarting up uh, his Bible studies on the uh, and he's going to be looking at the book of James. So it always goes in depth, always good. And there's always uh, a lot of wonderful, good questions, a lot of good good crowds. So coming out for that. Tell others who uh, uh, may have trouble coming on a Sunday and they want a uh, uh, deep Bible study. Come on. What was that? Oh, gotcha. I gotcha. All right, so the book of James, you want to go through the book of James. And then uh, coming up at the end of the month, we'll have a, our uh, annual church business meeting. So be there for that as we move into missions conference month in February. All right, can we have some more kids come up for Awana? For Awana pledges. All right, which flag do you want? You want the Bible? There you go. All right, let's all stand up together for our Awana pledges. All right. Ready, stand, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To the Awana flag? I pledge allegiance to the Awana flag, which stands for the Awana clubs, whose goal is to reach boys and girls for the gospel of Christ and train them to serve him. And the Bible? I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide his words in my heart that I might not sin against God. All right, you can be seated. Brother Stephen, you want to come forward? All right. Oh, I didn't even flip these. Our uh, Bible verse for this Wednesday is Colossians 1.3. Colossians 1.3, you can say it with me. Colossians 1.3, 1, 
We give thanks to God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Let's say it again, Colossians 1, 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Colosenses capítulo 1, versículo 3. Damos gracias al Dios y Padre del Señor nuestro Jesucristo, siempre orando por vosotros. Colosenses 1, 3. Damos gracias al Dios y Padre del Señor nuestro Jesucristo, siempre orando por vosotros. All right. Pop quiz. What two things Paul is writing to the church in Colossae. What two things in this verse is Paul doing? Thanking. Yeah, we give thanks to God. And praying. Praying. So we need to be doing the same. All right, Brother Stephen, will you open us in prayer? Let's pray. Señor, te damos gracias por la gran oportunidad y privilegio que tenemos de poder congregarnos como hermanos para estudiar tu palabra. Te rogamos, Señor, que abra nuestros entendimientos, nuestros corazones, Señor, que estén con, totalmente concentrados en creer, aprender y absorber tu palabra para que podamos crecer y madurar más en la fe, Señor. Te rogamos que nos dirija y que tu Espíritu Santo nos dé la palabra que necesitamos para ministrar en tu nombre, Señor. Que así sea tu perfecta voluntad. Te lo rogamos y te damos gracias en el nombre de Jesús nuevamente, Señor. Amén, amén. Amén. Thank you, brother. All right, if you want to go to Stephen's Bible study, go that way. If you want to go be a kid again, go that way. And uh, the rest can stay here. So, yeah, this is, uh, if anyone was here last week, they should have that one. And then this is a new one. Okay, so we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Can anybody tell me what chapter 17 was about? And we we got to turn off some sound. So the mic still has to be live to go to the internet. Uh, but there's no sound coming through here. All right, so 1 Samuel chapter 18 is where we're going to be. What is 1 Samuel 7, 17 about? David and Goliath. Yeah, the whole chapter is about David and Goliath. We took about three weeks to go through David and Goliath. Huh? Actual fight? Yes. Yeah, so last week we did actual, the actual battle. We spent a couple previous weeks uh, introducing Goliath and how tall he was and the army he had. And we spent some time on the location uh, that the battle took place, the Valley of Ella. Uh, the Valley of Ella. And uh, so it was very intriguing to see some uh, video footage from uh, the Valley of Ella. And then uh, so they had the battle. And uh, how did uh, David approach Goliath? Yeah, with confidence. How do we know his confidence? He ran. He ran to Goliath, right? And uh, and Goliath, he sauntered up to um, to David, and we find that he, uh, you know, was upset that they would send out such a youth to fight fight him. 
But uh, David took uh, one of the stones in his pocket, he had five of them, and he slung and hit him in the forehead, and Goliath went down. The, uh, the stone didn't kill him because we see he, David goes up and takes Goliath's sword and then kills him by chopping off his head, decapitating him. So where did the head go? It went to Jerusalem. It went to Jerusalem, yes. Yes, it wasn't an Israelite city yet. It was a Jebusite city, but it went to Jerusalem. Uh, the armor, where did the armor go? To, uh, yes. So David kept it in his tent. Took, David took possession of Goliath's armor. Uh, eventually you find later on that the sword ends up at the tabernacle. Uh, we know that because David... Uh, was on the run from Saul later on and went to the tabernacle for a sword. And uh, the uh, priest of Limelech says, uh, we only have Goliath's sword. And says, you can have it if you want. And so he took Goliath's sword. So we know the sword was roaming around a little bit as well. And then the Philistines, they ran uh, when Goliath was killed. The Israelites somehow and all of a sudden now they got courage and they go chasing after the Philistines and there's uh, dead bodies from here to Gath. Uh, so uh, as they, they pursued the Philistines. At the end, we find, at the end of chapter 17, we find that King Saul is asking whose father is this, whose family is this, come from, is this? Um, and so David was brought in and said, my father's Jesse. And so we we're kind of intriguing why this question would be, because David has already served Saul in his court playing the harp, so it's not something he would have known. I think it more has to do with probably a legal um, the technicality on David or uh, King Saul's offering an award for killing Goliath, and part of that award was uh, free and not having to pay taxes. The family didn't have to pay taxes for the rest of their lives. So you kind of have to know who that is to tell the tax collector, don't collect any taxes from Jesse's family, making sure that's Jesse's family. And then, of course, uh, there was going to be a discussion of where uh, King Saul had offered his daughter uh, to be uh, the wife of the one who killed Saul, or killed the Goliath. And so there was some, some of that. Who's, uh, whose family is uh, the, uh, this, this David from? So that's where we left off in chapter 17. All right, so chapter 18, we're going to talk about David and Jonathan. Uh, we're going to talk about Saul getting upset for uh, upset uh, with David and that relationship quickly deteriorating. So 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul. So an end of speaking to Saul, we had just come, David is with Saul in, the, in his court, and they're talking about uh, the death of Goliath and what David had done. And yes, my father's name is Jesse. And so, so at the end of speaking unto Saul, uh, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So we have Jonathan's there in the court uh, with the king, his father. David comes in. David has just become a, a national hero by killing Goliath. And that Jonathan had uh, this affection for, for David and admiration for, for David. And we see here the soul was knit with the soul of, of David. And Unfortunately, many may take this as a homosexual relationship. It is clearly not that in any way um, that's the case. Uh, it's just a, a friendship, a friendship that has occurred. And we find here that uh, um, Jonathan became one of David's best friends. So this is a, a strong loyalty between David and Jonathan. And we talk, talked about earlier how Jonathan is quite a bit older than, than David. Um, at this point, David's probably about 15, and and uh, Jonathan is probably about 30 or so, so quite a bit older. Verse 2, and Saul took him that day and would let him go no more to his father's house. Well, that's kind of an odd verse if you just look at it like that, right? He's not going to let him go to his father's house. In other words, King Saul drafted him for his use. You have a national hero. What puts you to use? Let's not let you go back home and, you know, you're, you've, you've clearly elevated yourself from being a shepherd. You've shown yourself to be a natural hero. What's put you to, uh, to work in, in the palace? 
work for me. King Saul's saying, won't work for me. So he's drafting David into full-time service. Verse 3, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And so there's this covenant that Jonathan and David uh, make together that they're going to look out for each other. And we see here in verse 4, and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and his bow, bow and to his girdle. Okay, so what does that mean? So Saul, uh, oh, Jonathan gives David his robe and his garments, his sword, his bow, and his girdle. What is that? What's going on here? Anybody? So Jonathan's father is Saul. So who's next in line? Jonathan. Jonathan is next in line to be king, right? We know that David is, a, is, gonna, is anointed to be the next king, but nobody knows that yet. But Jonathan is the rightful heir of the throne of his father, King Saul. And so Jonathan has his royal garments on, his sword and all that, and Jonathan takes that off and gives it to David. What is Jonathan doing? So Jonathan's wearing military apparel, his royal apparel, and giving it to David is clearly an honor. But I think it's more than an honor. It seems to be that though Jonathan was the apparent heir of the throne, Jonathan is stripping, stripping himself of all of his regalia and giving it to David. Jonathan is recognizing David's divine appointment to be the next king. He's, he's recognizing that throne is not going to be mine. God has given it to David. And Jonathan's already recognizing that. And Jonathan's already falling in line with that to God's, to God's will. So somehow Jonathan is already recognizing David's divine appointment and is honoring him by giving him his robe and his sword. 1 Samuel 24, verse 16 says, And it came to pass, when David have made an end of speaking these words, and it's all that Saul said, is, that, is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. We find here that even Saul is starting to call him son. We see my son David taking him into the family, part of, part of the family. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 21 says, Then said Saul, I have sinned, return my son David, for I will no more do thee harm so there's a, this is close to a connection here with David and now King Saul and, and Jonathan. Recognizing what's going to be taking place. The, next, the heir apparent is not going to be Jonathan anymore. It's going to be David. Which means Saul is going to get upset. Jonathan's not upset. Jonathan is, is the rightful heir of the throne. But he's not going to get upset. He's embracing the fact that God has chosen it's going to be David. And so they make this they have this uh, covenant, this, this uh, agreement together, and, and Jonathan's going to be helping David out and protecting David, and so he sees that. But Je Saul's going to get jealous, isn't he? Saul's going to get jealous. Verse 5, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely, and Saul sent him over sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Remember, David has now been drafted into the king's, for the king's use, so King Saul's uses him, and David does whatever the king asks him to do. He accomplishes everything he asks, whithersoever Saul sent him, that's where he went. So king Saul assigned him to do this duty, well, he went and did it. He said, and that duty went and did it. And how did David react? How did David act? He behaved wisely. He behaved wisely. He was humble. He was, uh, he was hardworking. He was respectful. He handled himself very well. Right? He was an example, something pointing to the Lord. And he acted in a way that nobody could say anything against him. There was nothing that they could say that David was wrong. There was no, nothing there. David acted very wisely, and we need to do that as Christians as well. 
we need to act uh, wisely in front of in front of everybody. We'll talk about that on Sunday morning in First Peter chapter two. And Saul sent him over the men of war. So now he's actually giving him command over portions of the army. Giving him command. Sent him over the men of war. He's only a young 15-year-old, we think. He just became a hero of Goliath. And now Saul is putting him over the men of war. And notice he was accepted in the sight of all people. They accepted him. It wasn't this young man that, why are you here? Why are you, circ- why are you circumventing the system? You're not, you know, haven't gone through the, the training and so forth. They accepted him. So he was accepted. The Lord was blessing him mightily. The Lord was blessing him mightily, elevating him and moving, moving through the, the different aspects of, uh, of what a king has to do and leading an army and leading people and behaving appropriately. And being accepted in the sight of all people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So of all of Saul's, um, the cabinet members of Saul, all of his, everybody that worked for, for the king, they also respected him. Isn't that what you want, to have the respect from all people and uh, there's nothing they could say against you? So his actions were accepted by the public. Verse 6, and it came to pass as they, went, as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets with joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So as he's moving through the country for his various duties, him and, the, and King Saul... Uh, everyone's coming out. The ladies are coming out. Everyone's coming out, and they are uh, excited to see this national hero come through. And let me see the one that killed Goliath. And notice they're singing and dancing and singing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. How would you feel if somebody else got sung those songs and you were not? How do you think King Saul feels? He's not very happy with that, right? Somebody else is getting attention when he wants the attention. Notice the opposite reaction with Jonathan. Jonathan is happy that David is getting that attention. King Saul, the father, is very upset with that attention. We see that in verse 8. And Saul was very wroth, very angry, and and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? So King Saul is very angry and like, how can this be? How can they be singing this song and they're giving him more adulation than they are giving to the king? How, why is this can be? And, what, and notice this last basically sarcastic remark here at the end. What can he have more but the kingdom? I mean, there's nothing else he could have except for the kingdom. And probably as soon as Saul is saying that out of his mouth sarcastically, the light turns on inside. Like, oh, maybe he is getting the kingdom. <laughs> maybe God has him in line for the kingdom. And so that was kind of a fortuitous statement, wasn't it? So what else could David have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. So then that statement comes out in the realization that Jonathan had already has. Saul eyed David. He was suspicious and wondering. David's now on his radar on taking his throne and from that day forward. Verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. You know, as soon as the, David is now in the eyes of Saul, the suspicion, what is Saul, what do you think Saul wants to do now? Eliminate him. Let's get rid of this. Right? Remember King Herod? When he found out where is the king of the Jews, what did King Herod want to do? Kill all the babies two years and younger, make sure we get him because I don't want him to take my place. King Saul doesn't want David to take his place. So now he's going to have many, many attempts to kill David. 
And interesting here, and it came to pass on the morrow the next day that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. An evil spirit from God. What do you think about that? Does God give evil spirits? Is that a hard one to talk about? The fact is, Satan or any of the demons, fallen angels, cannot do anything without God's permission. Right? Remember Job? Satan goes up to heaven and says, and talks about Job, and what about this man Job here? If you take everything away from him, uh, he will curse you. And God says, all right, you can do anything you want to him except kill him. Right? So there was boundaries put on Satan and what he could do to Job, and God gave him a vast amount of leeway to do with Job, and we find killed all of his ten children, the, the house, the, all of his property, his, his assets, and give him boils, sickness, and still Job still hung in there with God. Very fascinating book on Job, but we find that nothing can happen to you unless God allows it to happen. Gives permission, right? These, the evil spirit is not there because they're doing something God doesn't want them to do. God's allowing it to happen. God's using the evil spirit. God uses Satan and the demons for God's will. Okay? So the evil spirit came from God upon Saul. Well, let's just answer the question right here. Can a Christian be possessed by a demon? No. Cannot, right? Because we've given our lives over to the Lord. The Holy Spirit indwells in us. If the Holy Spirit indwells in us, can the demon come and occupy that same space? No. Not at all. So don't have that to be a concern at all. All right? Now, Satan is going to use anything and everything he can to attack you because he doesn't want you to go out and share the gospel, doesn't want you to lead people to Christ. So actually take that as a positive thing. I got to tell you, at home, there's all kinds of little things that are occurring in the house that, why is this happening? Why is all of a sudden now the water, there's a, there's a, a faucet doesn't turn off, and now there's, I have to turn off the water to the entire house? Or the microwave is making an unusual noise, or I need new tires, something like that. All these kind of things just happen. Well, it's like, Lord, what's going on? Oh, Satan is buffeting me because something great is going to happen. So... Particularly around a mission trip time, uh, I notice that there's an increased amount of oddities, and uh, that just to give you praise. Or maybe there's a little bit more stress in the home than normally. God is going. Satan's trying to use your Achilles heel, your uh, your weak spots, to come try to discourage you. Uh, let that be an encouragement that uh, if you're doing something great for God, God's going to do something great with you. Satan doesn't want you to do that, right? If you're not doing anything great for God, why does Satan need to spend any time, any resources on you? Does that make sense? Anyway, here we have Saul is being, um, has the evil spirit from God come upon him. Questions on what we just talked about? Does that make sense? You should be comforted in knowing that God has you in the palm of his hand and nothing can happen to you unless God allows it. That uh, God won't give you anything that you can't handle. And if things that are occurring that are very kind of strange and odd, or you can be uh, rest assured that uh, Satan doesn't like what you're doing, which is a good thing. So it came to pass that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. So kind of interesting here, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. An evil spirit comes upon him. So is there good, good things coming out of Saul's mouth? No. <laughs> An evil spirit is not going to let good things come out of his mouth. And prophesying doesn't necessarily mean he's telling the future, but he's professing, he's speaking truths. He's probably speaking things in a very harsh way. And we find here that David's playing with <clears throat> his hand as another other time playing with the harp as he normally did and so he's playing with the harp because why there's an evil spirit come upon Saul and playing the harp calms him down which leads us if you're having uh, uh, if your spirit's kind of troubled 
put on some nice Christian music, can uh, have something in the house that will um, keep the devil one, keep the devil and the demons away from you. You can do that. And David played with his hand as other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Awesome. Well, so I can just imagine King Saul's on his throne, and uh, in place of a scepter, is a javelin. Right? Goodness. Uh, you know, if you have a javelin in hand, uh, you're probably going to want to use it. <laughs> so he probably not, shouldn't have a javelin in his hand, and so he's contemplating what this, what to do. Verse 11, And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So he cast the, ja the javelin. So he's there and cast the javelin, and probably I will smite David even to the wall with it. That's one of those prophetic sayings from the evil spirit, right? What, what, he's, what the evil spirit's causing uh, David to do. Oh, and by the way, uh, we can testify that the devil doesn't make you do anything, okay? Because we know that for a fact, because during the millennial kingdom, Satan is going to be put in the, uh, the bottomless pit for a thousand years, right? Remember that? When the millennial kingdom occurs after Jesus' second coming, Satan is going to be put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and after a thousand years, he's going to be released. The reason why he's put in for that period of time instead of like the fire is to show, uh, well, his whole purpose, to, uh, Satan's whole purpose is to deceive the nations, deceive us. Well, he's going to be removed for a thousand years, and after a thousand years is up, what is he going to do? He's going to deceive. Now, what happens during that period of time of a thousand years? There's going to be children that are born, and they have the opportunity to accept or reject Christ. Unfortunately, at the end of a thousand years, there's going to be a large multitude of them who have rejected Christ, and Satan's going to use them to go attack Jerusalem, attack the, attack the saints, attack the believers. After that, he's going to be put in the lake of fire. Anyway, that's just to show that when we make a decision to go against God, it's our decision, and it's not Satan's decision for us. All right, so the javelin is thrown, and notice here, and David avoided out of his presence twice. So King Saul is going to do this twice. The second occurrence is described in chapter 19. So we just talked about the first occurrence. The author of 1 Samuel is noting there's two times. The second one is recorded in chapter 19 and verse 8. So 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 8. I'm going to move this along. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. So there's war again. Right, and David's there leading the, the army, and he fights, and David is victorious. Verse 9, And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. So similarly, again, there's a great victory, and Saul is fuming and upset that how can David have this great victory? And verse 10, And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with a javelin, but he slipped out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin to the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. So here's these two occurrences, and both times David avoids getting um, killed by the javelin. So back to chapter 18, verse 12. So if you're missing with your javelin, how do you start feeling? Verse 12, and Saul was afraid of David. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. As time goes along, Saul is seeing their handwriting on the wall. God is no longer with me. God is with David. And there is no way David should be alive now because I've just thrown javelin twice. I've sent him into the armies. He's faced Goliath. I mean, at every point in time, David should not have come out of that alive. The, the statistics the, uh, do not show a good return <laughs> to come out alive on this. But yet David continues to thrive even more and more. 
Verse 13, And therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. So, all right, so King Saul recognizes, well, this guy's not going to die in my presence. Let me uh, remove him, and I'll get him to be a, a captain. I'll send him out and uh, lead, lead my armies. What is King Saul actually doing? Trying to get him killed. Trying to get him killed. So this is to put David in a more dangerous position, a more likelihood that he'll be killed out on the front lines. Going in and out before the people means he was going to the battlefield. He was completing military missions. So they're at the end, and he went out and came in before the people. So there's one mission after another mission after another mission. He's being sent out to, to perform. Now, David is going to do something similar when he is king, isn't he? Anybody remember that story? Who was that guy? King Ur uh, no, Uriah. And Uriah, uh, this has to do with the story where David sees Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, and now Bathsheba's pregnant, and to cover this up, Uriah is sent to the battlefield. He's going to be on the front lines, have him put on the front lines. And so that's where he's killed. And so David's going to do something similar. And this is what King Saul's trying to do, trying to have David removed. He couldn't do it with his own hand, so maybe it'd be the hands of the Philistines, the enemies. And so you see it really doesn't happen either. You know the story about David. Verse 14, and David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Even with all this stress, even with King Saul coming after him, even with javelins being thrown, even with King Saul's anger, with all those evil things that were coming out of da uh, King Saul's mouth, David still behaved himself wisely in all his ways. In every aspect of his life, he still behaved wisely, and the Lord was with him. Lord, may we act wisely in all things, at the job, at the home, in our neighborhood. Lord, may you be with us as well. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. He was afraid of him. You know, the world sees that you're a Christian. The Lord sees that you behave wisely, you behave differently. And that might cause fear in some. Like, what does this person have that I don't have? Why is, why is he or she being successful? And why am I having trouble? Why are bad things, or maybe the person has bad things, but yet they come in with a smile on their face and there's joy. What does this person have that I don't have? Maybe that'll cause them to recognize, well, you have God. And I need God. How do you get God? And you can tell them. Verse 16, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. This national hero just became more and more elevated. Not only is he killing Goliath, he killed Goliath and became a national hero there. And he probably should have been put in a museum and just put on, on showcase. But now he's going in and out, leading mission, one mission after another. And the people just love him, love what he's doing. He's... He's become their guy, right? The man that they're following. So he tries. King Saul tries. Verse, <clears throat> verse 17, we get the story of Merib. Merib is, who's Merib? Merib is King Saul's oldest daughter. So we're going to find something, some more conniving by King Saul. and He's going to use his daughters to try to get it. 1 Samuel chapter 17, And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter Merib, her will I give thee to wife, only be thou valiant for me, and fight for the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. Now, remind me, King Saul had said, Anybody who kills Goliath will marry my daughter, right? Why are we talking about it now? Why is Saul, and what is Saul's request here? Be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. He's already won, right? He, was, he should have. King Saul should have given David his daughter at, at the death of Goliath. 
but that didn't happen. And here we have King Saul putting on some more um, requirements. Be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. Well, it says, I couldn't kill him. I'm going to let the Philistines kill him. All right, Merab, the daughter Merab, that name means increase. Increase. Her name means increase. Increase. And so again, David's going to do something similar with Uriah later on. Send him out to battle. Verse 18. And David said unto Saul, Who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? How, was, uh, how did David react to this request? I, I'm nobody. I'm not anybody that uh, should be uh, part of the royal family. I'm not, I'm not, shouldn't be there. I shouldn't be the, why should I be the son-in-law to the king? He's, so he's reluctant. He's reluctant to get married into the king's family. You know, if your father-in-law is trying to kill you, why would you want to marry into that family? <laughs> David's like, I really don't want this. This is not working out so well. Maybe I shouldn't have killed Goliath because I don't want to face... Uh, I got something else I'm facing here, my future father-in-law. So he's reluctant to be married, and we see humbleness in David's spirit. Who am I? You know, I'm not really anybody. What is my life? I'm, not, I'm just doing the Lord's work. Are we not doing anything spectacular? And we have Saul who told him to go out and fight. What did David do? He went out and fight. And indeed, he completed the additional actions of battle. Verse 19, but it came to pass at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adriel, the Methanite, to wife. So David does everything he's supposed to, everything he's been required to do. But then when he comes back to Saul, Saul is already like, sorry, I've already given my daughter to Adriel. You're too late. What do you mean I'm too late? You said I had to be marrying to your oldest daughter. Sorry. Already married her off. Adriel. Adriel, the name Adriel means flock of God. Flock of God. Why did Saul come up with an excuse not to marry his eldest daughter to David? The bloodline? We're going to see this in the next one because we have the second daughter. She's more infatuated with David than the oldest daughter. Mikkel, Mikkel tells her father that she actually loves David. Verse 20, and Mikkel, Mikkel Saul's daughter, tells, um, daughter loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. So Mikkel actually had fallen in love with David. Whereas Mirabel had, had not, was the oldest, and would be married off to, to him. And Mirabel, Mirab said, uh, Dad, I really don't like David. I don't want to be dated, David. But Michael, Michael did. Uh, Michael means, who is like God? Who is like God? Verse 21, and Saul said, I will give him her that she may be a snare to him, that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of twain. So the first plan, all these plans, javelin throwing, being sending up to be uh, the captain of the armies, and now sending him out with, for his first daughter, none of those worked. We see here that the thing pleased Saul because there was another opportunity to send David out into danger. So he comes up with another plan to kill David. None of these plans seem to be very uh, ingenious, right? Nothing spectacular, nothing new. He's doing the same thing again and again. And so we find he's speaking more and more. Every time he's speaking more boldly on what he wants to do to David, right? This time I'll give her that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So more and more bold in what he's going after David. So again, 
telling your heart, right? The, thing, the things that are coming, if you're speaking something out of your mouth, it's really what's telling in your heart. And so we see this, Saul's heart. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou this day be my son-in-law and the one of the twain. And so Saul is uh, encouraged and tells him, you have a, basically tells David, I'm going to give you a second chance to be a part of my family. You missed out on the first chance, but there's a second daughter, and I'm going to give you another chance to be a part of my family. Isn't that great? How do you think David feels about that? Oh, goodness, I'm a little cautious. I'm cautious with this offer and cautious with, as I was cautious with the previous offer. And we see that here in verse 22. And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delighted in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. So Saul goes to David personally. You know, you have another chance to be my son-in-law. Probably we can see the reaction on David was, oh, I really don't want to. So this is why Saul had to tell his servants on the side, why don't you go and encourage him on the side, secretly tell him that, uh, yes, your king, uh, king Saul wants to be your father-in-law, but love to have you part of the family. Uh, I think David's a little, he's seeing what's going on here. Verse 23. So they're trying to convince David to be his son-in-law. Verse 23, And Saul's servants spake those words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am poor, a poor man and lightly esteemed? You think this is an easy thing? You think I should be doing this? You can see his hesitancy. And then you, you can see a little bit of insight of why he didn't get the oldest daughter. He, he recognizes that he's a poor man. He doesn't have a dowry to give to the king for the king's daughter. There's no dowry. I'm a poor man. I'm lightly esteemed. I'm, I'm really nobody. Again, you can see his humbleness there. You can see his financial status. He's, uh, he's poor. How can I be the king's son-in-law if I got these? And it's really, this is a really big decision to be a part of the king's family. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this banner spake David. So they relayed the information to the king. This is what David's feeling. This is what his hesitancy. This is what the hurdles are. This is what's going on. And so then, in verse 25, And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry. We're going to remove that. That's not an issue. The dowry is not an issue. The financial portion is not an issue. And we'll replace the dower with a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. But a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Give me a hundred foreskins, it will show that you personally killed a hundred Philistines. This is hand to hand combat. Hand to hand combat, more likely to die, right? <laughs> than, to, than to be throwing javelins and arrows and. You know, you're personally going after a hundred men. And we find here, we know David, Saul sought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. He's going to die in battle. So this will require a lot of sword fights, a hundred, at least a hundred sword fights. And David will have to die. There has to be a sure chance that David dies at the hand of the Philistines. Well, what happens? Verse 26, and when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. So apparently there must have been a, uh, this means there must have been a time constraint. Well, you have to the end of the week to make up your decision whether you want to marry my daughter. And so he came back and says, yeah, so there must have been pressure as well. Okay, right, this offer is only last for so long. Uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the month, or at the end of the week, whatever, the offer is no longer standing. I'm going to give her, there's another man waiting in the wings to marry her off. You missed the last one. Don't let this one go by. You know, all this pressure probably pressure on to David to make a decision. Anyway, so this, he cleared the part about the financial status. He didn't have to have a dowry. And so he, he accepted, accepted this. It pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. And the days were not expired. Wherefore, David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines 200 men. 
and brought David brought their foreskins. All right, so what was the minimal requirement to get the king's daughter? 100. He gets 200. 200. Kills 200 men. And they gave them in full tale to the king. All the stories of all what David did and how he, he killed these 200 men that he might be the king's son-in-law. Well, how do you not give your daughter to... He, he doubled the requirement. He got 200. Clearly Saul did not get what he wanted. <laughs> David's death. And so he had to keep his... Uh, his promise. And so Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. Verse 29, and Saul, Saul and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael's Saul daughter loved him. So now, he, he, I mean, each time he sees more and more. There's no way you could get through this without the Lord, without the Lord's protection. And by the way, nothing can happen to you if you're in the Lord's will, if you're doing the Lord's will. If you go, uh, go walk the streets, if you drive down the road, if you go into a war zone, nothing can happen to you unless the Lord allows it to happen. You can see that with, Saul, uh, with David. David, nothing, God did not allow anything to happen to David through this whole time. Why? Because God had a purpose for David. God has a purpose for you, and you'll fulfill that purpose until that time is done. Right? So be encouraged. No, no, Saul knew that the Lord was with David, so he knows that. He knows for sure now. He knows he's, God has left him. But what else, what else does he see? Michael loved him. Now David has lost his own daughter. He does, he, maybe he's thinking, I'll have a daughter that's within uh, David's circle. I can have influence there. I can talk to my daughter, and she can kind of sneak or maybe even poison David. Something of that nature, but he sees, no, Michael has totally given her heart over to David. David Michael loved David. Verse 29, and Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Again, that more and more and more, right? Verse 30, then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. Even throughout all this, all the things that have going on, David is still behaving wisely, more wisely than any other servants. The Lord was clearly with David. We can see a couple of things here. David was more successful in defeating the Philistines than any other General, any other of Saul's captains. David became precious by the people. And King Saul stopped killing, trying to kill David indirectly and was going after him, right? So you can see from the beginning, it was kind of privately throwing a javelin. Next thing is outwardly opening. Next thing, this is my plan to kill David. And yet, God continues to honor him more and more and more and more. So that is chapter 18. Questions, comments? All right, God has a purpose for each and every one of you. Behave wisely. Seek God's wisdom. And God will honor you. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for David. Lord, we thank you for the example he is in this chapter here, Lord. And Lord, uh, through uh, trials and tribulations, to yet always rely on you, Lord. And Lord, that you uh, continue to, to bless him and Lord, uh, and protect him, Lord, even though things get worse and worse. Lord, be with each one here, Lord, and those online. Lord, may you bless each one in a mighty way, Lord. Lord, as difficulties come, Lord, may... Each one continue to rely on you and continue to move forward with your, their eyes on you. Lord, uh, may you uh, protect us from evil. Lord, uh, and guide us through, Lord, that you would be glorified in all things. Lord, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.